Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Zoe, a member of the ICCT communications team. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and we will send out the recording to all participants sometime next week. Everyone has their microphones on mute. If you have questions, you can write them in the questions box and the control panel to the right of your screen. After the presentation, we will have a few minutes to answer questions from the audience. Today, we are going to talk about emissions from ships sailing the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway in 2019, presented by Ji Hong Meng. Ji Hong is an associate researcher on the Marine team. But before Ji Hong's presentation, I would like to introduce Brian Comer, Marine Program Lead at the ICCT, who will give some brief remarks. Thanks, Zoe. I started my career researching uh, emissions from Great Lakes freight transportation when I was a student at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I've also done social science and environmental science research related to the lakes and those who call the region home when I was a fellow at NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab and also when I was a fellow at the Great Lakes Commission. Both of those were in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And after that, I came to the ICCT in 2015. And the first thing that I helped develop when I started here was a model that can estimate ship emissions using satellite data. And since then, I've always wanted to estimate emissions from shipping on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway. And it only took us seven years, but here we are, we have it. Uh, so we hope that this research serves as a starting point for investigating the magnitude and distribution of ship emissions in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway, and for exploring opportunities for researching, developing, and deploying new technologies to power ships with low life cycle emission fuels and renewable electricity to help mitigate the negative impacts of climate change and to improve air quality and public health in the region. My colleague, uh, my colleague Ji Hong Meng, who is joining us from ICCT's Beijing office, so um, late evening for him. We're really appreciative that he's joining us at this hour. He led this uh, analysis, and it's my pleasure to introduce him to present our research results. Over to you, Ji Hong. Uh, thanks, Brian, uh, for introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Ji Hong Meng. I'm glad to have this opportunity to make this presentation. Um, today, I'm going to present you a briefing paper published by CCT recently about Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway ship emission inventory in 2019. First, I want to share some general background of this study to explain why we carry out this research and why we think it's important. Uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway stretch more than 3,700 kilometers from Atlantic Ocean to North America as an important com uh, commercial waterway both for United States and Canada. As we can see in the right figure, there are more than 110 ports within the Great Lake and Central Seaway system, and the vessel operators transported over 143.5 million tons of cargo with a value of uh, 15.2 billion US, um, dollars on this system in 2017. For the Great Lakes Central Seaway Maritime Five Years Action Plan, it's planning to double maritime trade with Western Europe and also double annual passenger traffic in next five years. So it will not be surprising that the ship emissions in this region will also increase with the maritime trade transportation increment if no additional uh, action is taken. Why research has found that ships are relatively efficient mode of cargo trans uh, transportation. The sector currently relies on fossil fuels, which will pollute the air and contribute to climate change. Considering the plan to double maritime trade, the Great Lakes Central Seaway Governors and Primaries, also named GSGP, partnered with Green Marine to identify opportunities to improve uh, environmental performance in the region's maritime system and published the Green Shipping Action Plan in 2021. The action plan, uh, the action plan repre represents steps to improve regional environmental performance. For maritime in industry, they are planning to assess current impacts by carrying out detailed annual emission inventories and set reduction targets based on data. Based on the inventories and target, GSGP is also planning to carry out projects on smart shipping, 
uh, voyage op op uh, optimization and uh, alternative, alternative fuels. So with the emission inventories as a very basic result for any further project and work, we think it should be a good opportunity to update the maritime emission inventories of this region. Uh, the first thing we do is that uh, we try to go back to the latest inventory before our research. And this is what we found, uh, published by EPA in 2012. It estimated around uh, 547 tons of carbon dioxide uh, CO2 emission in 2002. And it also predicted the emission would increase to 700,000 tons by 2020. As we can see, it's an inventory of 2002, which means it was result about 20 years ago, and things is always changing year by year. So um, the inventory, the uh, emission inventory, uh, will be quite different from the uh, inventory public published by EPA 20 years uh, uh, in 2012. Further, this inventory only includes Category 3 vessels within United States portion of the Great Lakes, which means it didn't include the Canada portion and the St. Lawrence Seaway region. Under this situation, we considered an updated emission inventory for the whole Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway was necessary for any further emission control plan. And that's why we carried out this work. The work is based on the systematic assessment of vessel emissions, also named SAFE model, developed by ICCT Marine Team. Um, generally, it's based on ship activity data, ship characteristics from ship registry data, and the emission factors from IMO's greenhouse gas uh, study. For the ship activity data, we use the automatic identification system, also named AIS data, um, the AIC data includes ship's location and speed at a specific time step, so, so that we can identify whether the ship operated in the Great Lake and St. Lawrence Sea region and when this happened. Then the identified ships were matched with res uh, registry database to find out details of each ship, like ship type, size, engine power, maximum speed, flag state, and more. After that, we estimated fuel consumption and emissions based on the ship's activity and the characteristics. These are a function of fuel type, engine power, maximum speed, actual speed over ground, and emission factors. We also found that some of the ships were equipped with uh, exhaust gas cleaning system, also known as a scrubber. And SAFE model also includes individual emission in factors for those ships with scrubbers. Here is the study region of this research. Uh, the study region included the whole Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway region of both the United States and the Canada portion. We also separated regions of Great Lake and St. Lawrence Seaway around Cobalt to find more different emission features in these two different uh, regions. Here is an overview of the carbon dioxide emissions from ships in the Great Lake and St. Lawrence Seaway in 2019 and showing the figure with a 0.05 degree cell. Totally, we estimated approximately 1.6 million tons CO2 emissions in this region, of which about 1 million tons occurred within United States waters. From the spatial um, distribution we found in the St. Lawrence Seaway um, is here. The, re the relative narrow sailing channel had higher ship activity intensity compared to the whole uh, Great Lake region. And thus the emission intensity in the St. Lawrence Seaway was higher than the Great Lake region. We can see uh, brown and uh, red color in the St. Lawrence Seaway region. And unsurprisingly, the CO2 emissions were highest along the main shipping corridors in the whole region, colored with brown and red in the figure. So now we have a general sense of the CO2 emissions. Then let me show you more details. 
Uh, first, for uh, the whole ship fleet, we identified 953 vessels operating in the Great, and, Great Lake and St. Lawrence Seaway in 2019. Of, of these, four carriers were the most common, accounting for 40%, and second most common were chemical tankers, accounting for 22%. This is shown in the table, which also shows that in, in this region, ships flagged to Canada, the Marshall Islands, and the United States was the most common, accounting for 19%, 16%, and 10% of the total ship fleet, respectively. It's a little bit surprising that there were so many ships with Marshall Islands flag in the Great Lake and the San Lawrence Seaway region, as this region includes um, United, the United States waters and the Canada waters, but it's far away from Marshall Islands. So uh, let's turn to emission results to see what's different. In terms of um, CO2 emissions, the United States and Canada flagged vessels accounted for nearly 80% of the whole emissions in the region, each responsible for approximately 40% of the total emissions as shown in the figure in the table. Although there were many ocean-going Marshall Island flagged vessels in this region, they did not emit much CO2, so the difference between ship numbers and emissions shows the importance of understanding ship activity, and but not just uh, take a look at the number of the ship. For details, um, Marsh Islands flagged vessels operated for uh, around 77 hours in the whole region, compared to six, around 600,000 hours for Canada flagged vessels and 400,000 hours for United, United States flagged vessels. The big gap of activity hours lead to big emission difference. And for ship class, uh, if we take a look at these two small figures here, about 1 million ton was emitted by bulk carriers. Chemical tanker were distant second with 10% and tugs emitted about 9%. For ships with US flag, most of the emissions were from bulk carriers and tugboats. And for ships with Canada flag, Emissions were from bulk carriers and many other types of ships like uh, chemical tanker, ferries, and oil tanker. Further, as, as some of you know, uh, shore power will be a good choice to reduce CO2 emissions when ships are at berths around the terminals. This table provides uh, the emissions by ship type in different operating phases. So we, f we found that over 78% of the emissions were emitted by ships sailing at cruising speeds, and about 10.5% of emissions occurred when ships were at anchor, and about 8.5% occurred when at first. This means uh, around 19% of emissions were from ship at first or at anchor or at first. These emissions could be reduced or eliminated with using a combination of shore power and onboard batteries or fuel cell. The Great Lakes fleet could provide an opportunity for trading out these technologies, which will be needed to be scaled to enable a fully decarbonized, decarbonized uh, shipping sector. So um, as I mentioned, we also divided the whole region to two parts the Great Lake regions and the St. Lawrence Seaway regions. Uh, here I show you the difference of the uh, CO2 emissions between these two parts. First, we can look at the middle of the figure uh, of the total uh, emission from ships. Around 75% were emitted in the Great Lake region. However, uh, if we consider the area difference between the Great Lake and the St. Lo Lawrence Seaway, the St. Lawrence Seaway represents less than 1% of the area of the whole region, and yet it's home to 25% of the CO2 emissions. So the average CO2 emissions intensity in the St. Lawrence Seaway system was 36 times higher than the Great Lake region. Then we can look at the left and the, the right part of the figure. We can find the emissions within each region 
were distinct. For the Great Lake region, over 90% of the emissions were from Canada and the US United States flagships, and more, more than 50 of these were from United States flagships. However, for the St. Lawrence Seaway system, the United States flagships accounted for less than 1% of the emissions, like this very tiny uh, line shows. The contribution of each ship type to um, CO2 emissions was also different. Um, we can see the right part of this figure. For the Great Lake, uh, bulk carriers accounted for 75% of the CO2 emissions and tugs were distant second, emitted 11%. For the St. Lawrence Seaway system, emissions were more evenly spread across ship types, uh, like um, bulk carriers accounted for 22%, Container ships em emitted 23%, chemical tanker accounted for 22%, and oil tanker were responsible for 14%. So they are so different. Now we have no much about uh, CO2 emissions. Let's take a look at the fuel consumption results. We estimated that ships in the this region consumed about 510,000 tons of fuel in 2019. This equal to uh, six terawatt, terawatt hours or 20 trillion BTU, about enough to power a 70,000 person Great Lake City for a year. And in this uh, fuels, 83% of the fuel consumption was desolate fuels. So uh, these are fuels that have a sulfur content of less than 0.1% by mass to comply with the North America Emission Control Area regulations. Despite the Emission Control Area regulations, um, there, there was still 15% of the residual fuel, which, is, which with high sulfur content uh, of the whole fuel consumption, mostly by bulk carriers. So uh, these bulk carriers are equipped with um, the scrubber and they are allowed to use uh, residual fuels because scrubber can help them to reduce the sulfur oxide emissions. Um, so uh, lastly, lastly, we found that the use of um, liquefied natural gas is not significant in this region, only accounted for 2% of the whole fuel consumptions. So this result can be used to estimate how much energy or low carbon fuel will be needed to decarbonize uh, uh, shipping the ship sec sector in the Great Lake and the St. Lawrence Seaway. And now uh, here are some takeaway bullets for you. The first one is that ship consumed more than uh, 500,000 tons of uh, fuels equals to six terawatt hours of or 20 trillion BTU, about enough to power a 70,000 person Great Lakes city for a year. The second, approximately 1.6 million tons of CO2 emissions in the region in 2019, equivalent to um, 350,000 cars. And by ship type, bulk areas was the largest contributor to Great Lakes, the Great Lake and St. Lawrence Seaway CO2 emissions, accounting for 62%. The United States and uh, Canada flagged vessels emitted 80% of the CO2 emissions in the region in 2019, split roughly evenly. And the last one, by operating phase, 90% of emissions were from ships at anchor or at berth, which could be reduced or eliminated using a combination of shore power and onboard batteries or fuel cells. And you can also find the paper from our website. We also provide more details in the appendix part of the paper, uh, including CO2 emissions and fuel consumption results of the Great Lake region and the San Lawrence portion. And we also provide other climate and air uh, pollutant emission results, include, including black carbon, uh, sulfur oxides, PM10, PM2.5, uh, nitric oxide, VOC, and more. And we also provide an ArcGIS shape file contains the graded CO2 emission inventory for the Great Lake and San Lawrence Seaway at 0.05 degree resolution. 
And we also intend to uh, periodically update this analysis with results for other years as data and resources allow. This is all that I want to present today and I'm happy to answer any questions from you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Zihong. Um, now we can begin the Q&A section of the webinar. Remember, if you have any questions, you can write them in the questions box and we will answer as many as we can. All right, so first question here. Um, why is it interesting to focus on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway? Thanks, Zoe, and uh, thanks, Jihong. Um, so we were interested in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway because uh, there's increasing attention being paid to decarbonizing the shipping sector in general. And in the United States, um, as one example, there's also efforts to invest in uh, new port infrastructure under the um, uh, Port Infrastructure Development Program. Um, including port electrification. And then also there's opportunities to invest in the US flagged fleet. The Great Lakes is sort of interesting because there are some ships that are operating on the lakes that um, because of how they're designed and also just sometimes just how long they are, they will never escape the lakes. Um, some of the largest bulk carriers are over a thousand feet long, um, over 300 meters. And so, this provides an opportunity to make investments in new fuels and technologies, test out uh, research and development for ship owners that are interested. And um, when you're making those investments in the region, you can pretty much guarantee that the benefits that accrue from that are going to stay within the region itself. And that would include uh, making progress on research and development that could be uh, developed in the US and Canada for use not only on U.S. and Canadian flagged ships and owned ships, but also could be used for broader decarbonization efforts across the shipping sector and also reducing air pollution and the associated health impacts and environmental justice impacts. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, another question here, I think for Jihong. Can you go into more details about the scrubbers being used and any infrastructure to support their use on fresh water? Uh, okay, um, actually, uh, more details about Scrubber is not included in this slides, but it's also, it's included in our paper. Um, so, uh, what, uh, what I can answer you here is about that uh, the ships equipped with Scrubbers will uh, consume around 15% 15, uh, 15 of the uh, fuel consumptions. Uh, which represents around um, around six uh, sixty thousand ton uh, residuals consumptions in the Great Lake and San Lawrence Seaway system, and any infrastructure to support their use. Um, yeah, I think um, for now I cannot uh, provide more details about uh, infra infrastructure to support their use in fresh water um, as uh, for the emission control area resolution regulation, um, the ships are allowed to use scrubbers. And if they use scrubbers, uh, they can they can just use red fuel, but they don't need to use the uh, desolate fuels. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can provide oh. a, a bit more information as well. So the Ships that are using scrubbers on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway are mainly bulk carriers, which we show here. And um, those are um, going to be using closed loop scrubbers. And so they're um, recirculating um, water that they are spraying into the exhaust and collecting it, filtering it, and then uh, treating it with an alkaline solution. And the alkaline solution is what's neutralizing the um, sulfur oxides and acids in the exhaust itself in order to achieve an equivalent amount of 
um, sulfur oxide reduction as if the ships were using emission control area compliant fuel, which would be 1,000 ppm sulfur. Um, there's a couple reasons for using the closed loop scrubbers. Most of the ships that are operating on scrubbers, globally there's um, almost, well, I, there's probably more than 5,000 now. 85% um, of them are using open loop scrubbers where they're just bringing in seawater and spraying it into the exhaust and then discharging it overboard. Another 14% are hybrid systems where they can run on open loop mode, but they can also run on closed loop mode. And then 1% are um, closed loop systems. And the Great Lakes, the fresh water itself is not alkaline enough to be used as the buffering solution is one reason why we're using closed loop. Another is because of the um, potential economic or potential environmental impacts of running open loop scrubbers. Um, because what's collected in the exhaust is discharge overboard. But the closed loop scrubbers are um, are not completely zero emission because some of the recirculating water is discharged as bleed off water to the lakes. And that still contains contamination from heavy metals that are in the fuel and then also polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, so some of that is removed um, from the filtering process for the closed loop scrubbers. And then that sludge is that's um, collected is needs to be discharged to an on-land facility. We haven't looked at where those are in the lakes and how those are being handled, um, but that would be the requirement according to IMO regulations. Great, thank you so much, Brian. Um, Next question here. You mentioned the EPA's 2012 C3 inventory. Were you able to compare your inventory estimates against the EPA's 2017 national emissions inventory? Um, um, uh, I cannot remember the exact um, results from the EPA's 2017 national emission inventory. Um, Brian, do you remember any um, like carbon dioxide results from that one? Yeah, there there are estimates of domestic shipping emissions in the um, national emissions inventory, and there's also estimates of uh, emissions associated with fuel sold for international shipping. Both of those are about 40, 42 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions each year. Um, for CO2, it's about 40. And so the it, it's sort of, um, it's not going to be a direct comparison here because uh, we're doing it based on um, ship activity versus fuel consumption uh, or fuel sales. So it's a little bit apples and oranges, but um, the U.S. side we had a million tons of um, million tons of CO2 on the U.S. side, and so that would be about two and a half percent of the national inventory. But it's it's not a direct comparison that can be made. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Uh, Let's do this one. Can you put the results into context? How much is 1.6 million tons of CO2? Ji Hong, do you want to take that? I think you've got um, some of that on the on the board here. Um, I cannot see the question. <laughs> uh, uh, they're 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 just wondering um, about 1.6 million tons of CO2 and what that could be equivalent to oh yeah um yeah uh the 1.6 million ton of co2 emissions uh it will equivalent to around uh 350 cars um it's some um generally it's uh some uh typically uh passenger cars and um it equals to uh, 357 cars. And it's just give you a sense of how much emissions it is. Great. And uh, sorry, Zoe, somebody asked yeah. to put the study in the chat and I did that, but I <laughs> I only sent it to okay. you and oh. Tom. So <laughs> I'll put that in now. Uh, there are a couple other questions. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I saw you have sent it. Oh, OK, thank you. There's yeah. a couple other questions that I could run through quickly if you'd like, Zoe. Go ahead, Brian, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Um, we talked about, so I answered the question on the how we identified at anchor and at birth activities from the AIS data in the chat and provided a link to um, the detailed methodology for the systematic assessment of vessel emissions model. And the, the short answer is if the ship is going very slowly and is near shore or near a port, um, depending on how close they are and how slow they're going, we identify them as at birth or at anchor. Um, there could be some, some situations where those emissions are misallocated. It could be that the ship is going very slowly. Um, so there could be some overestimate of at birth and at anchor emissions, but overall we think that the proportion is about right. There's a question about the source of the ship registry data. Uh, that's from IHS Market. And then there's a question on, are you able to create a heat map of emissions from your data? Uh, Ji Hong, will you pull up the, the map? Um, well, um, do you mean this one? Yeah, so this looks, this uh, is sort of like a heat map. Um, we did a gridded emissions inventory. The um, patterns that you're seeing on the screen are the ship, uh, is the ship traffic as identified by satellites. And then we've combined that with our um, save model to be able to estimate the uh, CO2 emissions within each of these grid cells. Uh, they're pretty small grid cells as well. And so this is the what the distribution looks like. And pretty much you end up splitting the lakes um, in half, taking more or less a straight line whenever possible. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I think we have answered all of the questions. Um, if you have any follow-up questions going forward, please email them to us. Uh, you can email them to communications at the ICCT.org. You'll all be getting a follow-up email after the webinar that will give you access to the slides um, and eventually the webinar recording, which will be uploaded in the next week or so. Um, thank you so much to everyone who participated today in our presentation, and please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have further questions. And remember to follow us all at the ICZT. Thanks again, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks.